All right. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Chafee again for the Plant Free MD podcast. Is here with a special guest, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, who was kind enough to come on the show. I was on her show uh, the other week, and now she's, you know, kind enough to come on mine. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, Anthony. Yeah. So uh, I was just going to say, just for those who people who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you do. Sure. So. Um... People like to call me a carnivore doc. I don't really look at myself as a carnivore doctor. Um, it's just that I have a YouTube channel where I tell the benefits of a carnivore diet. And the way I came across that is, well, I guess first academically, I did my bachelor's and my master's in nutrition and dietetics. And I did that in Lebanon. I'm not sure if I ever mentioned that before. No, um, so that. I'm actually Lebanese, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, and literally, the same month that I graduated with my master's degree, I hopped on a plane and I one way ticket to Miami and I did my PhD in exercise physiology. Mm -hmm. Technically it's with a minor in nutrition, but they removed that just because I had a master's in nutrition. So mm -hmm. I did not have to do this extra year in nutrition because I already had all those courses. So, so yeah. And I graduated with that doctorate and after a very long time, <laughs> Yeah. And then um, throughout that period of time, I was teaching at Miami Dade College. I'm still teaching at Miami Dade, actually. At first, I taught at UM, you know, as doctoral students, you're supposed to, you're supposed to teach nutrition. So I did that. And then once you graduate, um, I transferred to Miami Dade and I taught the same, you know, intro to nutrition course. I still do this part time online and um, and I'm doing a lot of, you know, entrepreneurial things, I guess creating online courses, YouTube channel, um, social media, things like that. So throughout that whole journey, um, I realized that it's very difficult to get fit eating what I was told was good for me, right? And um, it was very also difficult for me to to convert to being a, on a carnivore diet, like unlike you where, you were just told from a very young age, you know, you know, plants are poisonous. I, nobody ever told me, told me that, like for years, for decades, really, becoming a dietitian and then a PhD in the field. And then nobody ever mentioned the term anti-nutrient or poisons or plant self-defense chemicals until I was at my wits end, you know, constantly going through this yo-yo dieting, trying to get fit and then getting cravings and sugar addiction. And, you know, every time this would happen, I, I would go out and buy a new book <laughs> yeah. to understand why is this happening? So that's how I understood what functional medicine is learned, uh, from, you know, Dr. Mark Hyman and all those people, I bought all the books in the world. And then, Eventually, I came across Dr. Stephen Gundry's um, The Plant Paradox, which has, it's like a chock full of information. And I know it's, it's ironic. Everybody always laughs in the comments, like, isn't it funny how all the carnivores started with like Dr. Stephen Gundry and he's still recommending plant foods. It is funny, but at least it was in the right direction, you know? Yeah. It just planted the seed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how... I became a quote unquote carnivore doctor. I did not set out to be a carnivore doctor. That's not like, that's what I want to do. It's just, I want to, I want to be a YouTuber and share the passions that I have. And my passions are fitness and um, anti-aging. I do want to live forever. We can talk about that. I know it sounds crazy, but I think I could make a case for myself. And um and really music, music and rhythm. And, you know, that's, that's the ultimate goal. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think <clears throat> it is funny. You know, I think Dr. Gundry did, did so much great work in really pointing out, you know, the simple fact that, you know, plants defend themselves by have, using chemical deterrents and, and one of those being lectins and really, really broke the case wide open and really, uh, you know, showed people just how harmful these, these things are. And I, I think it's, it's quite a, you know, ironic that then he, is out is pushing a, a plant-based diet as well and you know, after, he, after he made such a good case That's for the true. fact that, that plants cause so much harm through these these chemical natural chemical deterrents and then says oh yeah but but you should still eat them like no no Why? You, you exactly. just, 
you know, you made such a strong argument. And, and, um, you know, so obviously, I think that uh, uh, you shouldn't eat plants, but, you know, and, you know, I, I think it might be that, you know, he's just sort of looking at lectins and saying, well, there's, there was a, there's a, a way around lectins uh, through various means. And these are sort of the main things. And maybe that's why he thinks that you can, you can sort of, you know, eat, eat plants uh, yeah. and, and get away with it. But obviously there are thousands and thousands and thousands of other uh, toxins and anti-nutrients and different sorts of things found in yeah. plants and vegetables that also cause harm. It's not just, it's not just lectins, you know, we become very myopic um, in, in what we think is wrong. We think, oh, this is the one wrong thing. We avoid that. And then we'll be okay. Like cholesterol, like carbs, like lectins. But of course, right. most things on earth are bad for you. There are very few select things that are actually good for you. And I think that's what we, we need True. to need to remember. Um, yeah. You know, that that's, it's interesting, you know, when you said that, you know, you were having, you know, yo-yo diets and different sorts of problems with that. When, when you had a master's in nutrition, yeah. and it's like, <laughs> you know, isn't that, isn't that funny that, you know, someone who, who gets taught, who, who should, you know, really um, know more than anybody, like this is exactly what you need to do in order yeah. to maintain optimal health. You know, you're doing these sorts of things that you learned that you got, you know, taught in your program and yet it's not really working for you. I mean, how crazy is that? It's insane. That's actually one of the reasons or the main reason I wanted to become a dietitian is because I thought that there's no dietitian who's not fit, right? Like 17 year old me, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And then <laughs> my first professor was not, not just overweight. I mean, I love her. She's amazing. But she she was even more than overweight, you know. Yeah. Like, wait, a second. I still remember that first semester. I was like, huh, my life plan is is try is not working right now. But yeah. then you know, I I still love the field, and I stuck with it. But I learned, I I don't think I was able to verbalize it back then. But now I I tell this to my students all the time. Like a really important life lesson is that don't ever take advice from somebody you don't want to end up looking like or being like. Yeah. And that goes for financial advice, relationship, diet, everything. Because what I've realized after being so deep into the knowledge and theory um, of things that once you try to apply the theory, nine out of 10 times, it just goes out the window, really. Yeah. Once you apply something, that's when you really figure out what works and what doesn't. And oftentimes it's those, those lonely heads that are saying the complete opposite of what the mainstream is saying. It seems that they're almost always right. Because think about it. What percentage of people have everything going for them? Like financially, relationship-wise, fitness and health at the same time, very few people, right? And so that makes sense that that advice is rare. And so you need to seek it out and pay attention to who's saying that and, and look at their transformation. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, it, you know, it's funny you say that, like, I agree, you know, you, you're, you're, you see someone who's like a, you know, a fitness expert or something like that, and they, they are not fit. And someone who's yeah. a nutrition expert, and they are not uh, uh, you know, healthy yeah. and they hide behind their lab coats and their degrees mm. behind them. It's like, no, show me your body. Let's, let's start there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was, um, there was a, there's a saying once before that I heard that it was like, never trust a skinny baker. And it always cracked me up. You know, it's just like, it's like, yeah, well, look, you know, if he's not eating his own food and getting fat from That's it, then obviously one. he's not any good. And, right. um, you know, so, you know, don't, don't trust, a, you know, an unhealthy doctor is probably a good, good way of doing it too. You know, either his advice isn't good enough for, for him to, to follow. And, and he's, you know, a bit of a hypocrite and saying, do what I say, not as I do, or his advice is bad. And, you know, I, I got into it with, uh, you know, a guy who um, is a bariatric surgeon, you know, he's going off about, you know, plant-based, you know, have to be vegan, this, that, and the other. It's just like, why do you exist as a profession if your advice works so well? You know, if your if your advice actually helps people get thin and helps them and helps them lose weight and get healthy, why the hell are you doing surgeries at all? You know, and it's just like you, you just can't even see yeah. that. You know that this guy's yeah. own recommendations are causing these people to get sick and unhealthy and require a life threatening 
surgery that has serious morbidity and lifelong ramifications. And people don't realize that they think, oh, this is going to make me thin. This is going to cure my diabetes and so forth. This has really, uh, you know, high uh, morbidity. And, and even if everything goes well, the purpose of this is to really restrict you and make it very painful and uncomfortable to eat food of any, of any description. And, yeah. you know, I've seen people that have had, you know, very serious problems with this. And I, you know, just in the hospital as patients, you know, when I was like, you know, an intern and, and, uh, and, you know, shortly after like in emergency department, so forth, we would always get people with gastric bands and post-surgery and stuff like that. There's always a problem. There's always a problem. There's always a problem. And they're always in so much pain and so much discomfort. And, yeah. and, you know, and then I've had, I've had, you know, family and friends who have underwent these, these surgeries and had horrific times, you know, had to get multiple yeah. reoperations. Um, yeah. you know, one, the, the, their, um, stomach, the outlet close us, uh, stenosed down to, you know, basically like a straw and the, I swear to God, the dietitian, the nutritionist that worked with this, uh, a bariatric surgeon said, well, look, you, you just have to get calories. You just have to get, it doesn't matter what it is. Just drink soda. You know, you just need to drink soda. You need to get 1200 calories a day from soda. And like, I, I wanted to drive down there and punch him in the face. You wow. know, it's like, you're, you're telling someone who has, you know, a serious eating, you know, issue with eating and, and problematic, you know, uh, relationship with food. And, yeah. and you, you've just done, you've hacked up their body to the point that they're completely nutrient deprived. Their hair was falling out. They're very unhealthy. They were, they were, they were really unwell. And you're telling them to actually eat in a more dysfunctional way. And that's your solution. I mean, what sick bastard, wow. you know, would you would, would think for a second that that was an appropriate piece of advice? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people that are just, they look at it as a job, you know, it's not, it's just, yeah. you know, I, I've had dietitians I went to school with who were like, yeah, I don't care if I get a job at Coca-Cola or like at a food industry, you know? to help yeah. them with the nutrition side of things. And I just, ever, from whenever I was very, very young, I just thought that that was mind blowing. I could never live for that. Like what's like, like there's so many ways to make money, you know, is it just about the money? I mean, is yeah. that happiness and fulfillment? I don't know. No, well, a lot of well, definitely not. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, like you say, you know, some people just approach this as a job and forget that your job is dealing with people's health and their yeah. life and, and the rest of their life. And, you know, especially when you're talking about medicine, you know, but even dietary recommendations, you're, you know, someone's giving some, Oh yeah, yeah. Just do this. And then, you, then they just go and you don't know what's going on after that. And maybe they have years and years yeah. of, of, of pathological eating and, and sickness because of that. But, you know, in, in medicine, especially, you know, these are real people and, and you, you, you cannot just look at them as like, Oh yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just my day job, whatever. That's yeah. someone's life. That is, a, that is a human being and they are coming to you for help and they're hurt and they're sick and they're scared and they need your help. And yeah. if, if people don't recognize that and actually really internalize that about how serious this, this is, I think they just need to get the hell out of the profession. And I'll, I'll say that to anybody right to their face. You know, anytime I'm operating or I'm getting ready to operate or I'm seeing somebody, I think to myself, what if this was my dad? You know, what if someone else was operating on my dad? What would I want? What would I want them to do? What would I need them to get ready for? And, and I just, I focus myself like that. And I'm just like, I'm going to give this person as the best care possible. And even, you know, you know, when I'm, when I'm doing something and I'm thinking about it, it's like, okay, well, maybe this, maybe this is a little bit out of my depth, you know, like, can I do this? Can I do this? And then I think to myself, it's like, okay, well, what if this was my family? Member? What if, uh, what if, you know, my, my dad was on the table and someone was having these thoughts. I'm like, you know, do I need to call someone in? Can I actually do this? as well as, as someone, as, as someone else. And I, I really do think about that. And if I, I go like, you know, no, someone else should be here. That's what, you know, when you're training, you have to think like that, you know, when you're early on in your career as a doctor, that's something that you really need to think about because you're going to hurt somebody and you could potentially kill them. And so if you, you can't have, you know, you can't get caught in, in your own hubris and think like, oh yeah, yeah, this will be fine because it may not. And so, you know, until you're, until you're confident, then you can do something as well as, you know, someone else, then you probably yeah. shouldn't be doing it. You know, you really need to, to get ready for that because this, this is someone's life and, and, 
you know, so, so, you know, like you say, you know, but people sort of look at this and they just, Oh, you just get these calories, this, that, and the other. And it's just like, would you tell your mother to do that? Would you tell your mother just drink a bunch of soda and that, and that's what you need to do. And it's like, Oh, um, I, yeah. I, I don't get, I don't understand it. I just, for me, this is also foreign people who do these kinds of things and who can live their lives like that. I, I don't get it. Mm. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's one of the things I think that, you know, in, in traditional nutrition, you know, we're, we're being taught by overweight, unhealthy professors. We're taking the, the yeah. textbook advice and it's not working. And yet we still just take old book, but this is what it is. And then we regurgitate it and pass it on. And, and, right. um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's great when, when people like yourself, you know, sort of look at this and get the traditional teaching and then just realize like, this isn't working, <laughs> like this doesn't work, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. And so you try to like search and, and find what the hell else, uh, it, yeah. it, it, you know, is out there that can work. And then eventually, you know, you find, you you found this, which is, which is great. Um, yeah. Personal experimentation is, is crucial. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, because uh, yeah, like you say, you know, these theoreticals, they're like, well, this is what it says in the book. Okay. But is it, is it true? Does it actually work in right. practice? Right. You know, if it doesn't, then it, it doesn't matter. You know, I, yeah. you know, I say kind of all the time is, you know, Richard Feynman, the American physicist said, you know, if it does, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And so these exactly. textbooks can say, you know, everything they want about you yeah. do this and you will get this. But then when you do it and it doesn't do that, you'd be like, well, yeah. that's, you know, that's out, you know, and there are individual, exactly. you know, sort of responses to different things, but, you know, by and large, if this isn't happening for the large majority of people, you know, yeah. probably, probably not the way. Um, yeah. So, you know, obviously I, I talk a lot about, you know, the poisons in plants and, you know, how, and that's how I first came to carnivores, just you know, learning that, that plants are, you know, they, their, their natural defense, one of their natural defenses is, is being poisonous. And so, you know, they don't want you to eat them. And so they, they work very hard to stop you from eating them. Um, you talk a lot about anti-nutrients as well. You know, I, I did a sort of a show on that, but, you know, and I touched on a lot of different sorts of things, but you know, the take home from that show wasn't, you know, to go through every single thing that's wrong with plants. It's just to illustrate just how damn many of these things there are, you know? And so, you know, maybe you can, can share with us some, some more that people don't yeah. know about and scare them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I wish somebody had mentioned this to me at any point in time, just, just the concept. I mean, just the idea that plants have self-defense chemicals in them. And once somebody hears that sentence, I think it can kickstart a chain of events that eventually leads them to reaching the conclusion that we have reached. Um, but yeah, so I, I also have a bunch of videos on my YouTube channel on different anti-nutrients because we call them anti-nutrients, those plant self-defense chemicals or poisons. Um, I have a lot of content there. I've done also an interview with uh, Professor Bart K on, on his YouTube channel, also where we talk about those things. But in a nutshell, you have, um, so in grains and beans and legumes, you have things like lectins and phytic acid. Those are kinds of anti-nutrients. Um, in grains, the, the probably most well-known anti-nutrient is gluten, but people don't realize is that it's not only the gluten, but also all grains have a family of anti-nutrients called prolamines. So for example, in oats, it's called avenin. What is avenin? Avenin is a type of prolamine, similar to how gluten is a type of prolamine. And they exist just to make it harder on the predator, um, to make the predator's life harder, basically, after they consume that grain or that seed. Um, you've got uh, saponins um, in the nightshade family of vegetables. The nightshade family of vegetables is probably the most inflammatory of the plant foods. Um, and those are the tomatoes, the peppers, uh, the goji berries, you know, the health halo and the goji berries. It's, it's actually a nightshade. And while we don't actually consume it, nicotine is actually also a nightshade um, yeah. vegetable. Um, eggplants. I mean, I grew up like in Lebanon, you, it's the Mediterranean diet. So we grew up eating 
you know, hummus and and eggplant dip. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It has a really funny name when I say it now. It's just not yeah. speaking in Arabic. Baba Ghanoush. Oh, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know it? Yeah. yeah. So it's an eggplant dip. It's delicious. I, you know, I, I love it. And, uh, and I just don't eat it anymore. And that's because it's a nightshade. Mm. So all those nightshades have that particular um, form of anti-nutrient called saponins. Um, potatoes is a nightshade. The specific kind of um, so a saponin in it, it will actually, yeah, the specific type of saponin in it is called solanine. You know, that green part in potatoes when they're improperly or improperly stored or stored for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, spinach has something called an aquaporin and it's also found in soy and corn, which is, which mimics kind of like your natural water channels and your cells and messes with, with them. Um, what else? I mean, we can keep going. Mm -hmm and going <laughs> we can talk about this more if you want so but so yeah. how did you come across these yourself you know because like you say you weren't you weren't taught this so you presumably had to sort of learn it yourself teach yourself what, what were your your sort of resources that you you found all these yeah things? so reading the book first of all and then um I was doing keto around that time when I was reading Dr. Gundry and it was popular to do zucchini spirals or zoodles um, where you get the zucchini and you turn it into a spiral and then you saute it with olive oil. Yeah. Well, I was just looking at different ways to do. That's so gross. Yeah, it is. Especially now that I found out that when I was doing everything right and I was convinced that I was going to be in ketosis, a state of fat burning. And I wasn't, I'm like, there's no way. I mean, I've, I'm in deep ketosis right now. I know exactly what I'm eating. I've been testing my ketones for a while. Like I have to be in ketosis mm -hmm. and I wasn't. And the only thing that was different was that I had started doing those zucchini in the like last couple mm -hmm. of days, doing those zucchini pasta things. And uh, I guess I was so stressed out internally. I didn't realize it. But the seeds of the zucchinis have anti-nutrients in them and the skins of plants generally, this is where they're, they're concentrated. And um, I was simply not in that fat burning mode. And that was when it really clicked because I was reading the information and I was doing it like experimenting, right? And I made the link, it's like, okay, so he's right. He, like, it's, it's because I'm consuming those anti-nutrients that's what's happening and this is when I started like I took a deep breath I'm like oh my god am I really gonna do this am I really gonna do carnivore now because I was also watching you know Michaela Peterson and Dr. Jordan Peterson and um, Sean Baker and Paul Saladino were getting on Joe Rogan and I knew in my head that that it made sense and I knew that that is probably the ideal way to go but I just couldn't you know it was just so different than what I grew up eating. You know, I grew up eating a plant-based diet. I grew up eating rice and beans and hummus and tabbouleh, which is like the um, kind of like a Mediterranean staple salad. Um, if you've ever been to a Mediterranean restaurant, that's like a basic thing that everybody eats. And so it, it was difficult for me, um, coupled with the very long um, brainwashing during traditional academia. It was very difficult for me to finally do that transition but but that was like a big a big trigger um another thing actually I, I forgot to mention this so my husband um would eat only carnivore when I first met him I we would get into like I'd always be on his case like how can you not eat fruits and vegetables like you have to focus on on eating your servings yeah He'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and he had like six pack. Well, not just yet because he didn't start competing, but very close to having a six pack. And um, I would be on his case like all the time to eat veggies at least. And the only vegetable he actually ate was a bed of spinach. So he only ate like eggs and egg whites, meat like turkey and chicken breast and beef, mainly meats all day long. And the only real vegetable he would eat was a bed of spinach that's actually how I found out about the aquaporins what is it in spinach and when we made the link later on 
and he he's always struggled with really debilitating low back pain, like really bad to the point where he eventually, after years, um, scheduled a uh, like a laser surgery. Um, but he was putting off the surgery for a very long period of time because he was very scared of going under and you know them operating so close to his spine and all that kind of stuff. And that was around the time when I was starting to understand what anti-nutrients are, learning about them. And, and, I, and I was like, okay, well, what is the only potential cause dietary wise that it could be? And I, I just suggested like, you know what, maybe, maybe cut out the spinach, just try, see what happens. And he did. And it went away, like back pain, so severe to the point of getting surgery for decades. He's had seen the top doctors at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital, all of those like big hospitals in Miami. And they were like, it's because you have a bulging disc because like there was a hurricane in the 90s and he was like moving a, a tree trunk away from his house and he injured his back. And they all just said, oh, it's because of that, that you have the pain. And we just always assumed it's the bulging disc. Well, now that he took out the spinach and it, it's like, it's like quietly went away. He didn't even realize it went away for a while. He was just not complaining about it anymore. That's when we realized that it was the inflammation from the diet that was exacerbating the mechanical damage that was inflicted upon his spine. And after a few months, he, he had not been eating spinach for a while. I think we were coming home from like the beach or something and just wanted something different, some, some veggie. And so we, uh, he bought a, a bag of spinach instantaneously, the low back pain and the soreness came back and with a vengeance for like three days after that. And that was it. That was like the 100% we were certain that that's what it was. And then also how I found out it was the aquaporins is because, um, a few like a little while later he had something with corn which he never ever touches corn but like I think it was Thanksgiving or something we had corn and it also came back and he started complaining I'm like I wonder what it what it is I mean you we had forgotten about that issue of yours and and that's when I dug into the research I was like what is the one common thing between the spinach and the corn and it turns out it's the aquaporins so that's that's another major thing also that made me even more convinced about the importance of eating a carnivore diet. Um, what else? And, and just my, my, my client, I had a client, well, actually she was a student of mine that I, uh, she took a semester of mine and uh, decided to do carnivore diet, reverse her psoriasis, her anxiety, depression went away. Um, she said, I feel happy and I'm losing weight. And I, you know, like all these things are happening and I couldn't have taken this course at a better time. So things like that, you know, with my clients, with my students made, made me convinced of like, yeah, that, that is, there's no doubt in my mind that it is the optimal human diet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think so as well. And obviously, you know, because of just copious amounts of data that, that suggest that, but also just how I feel as well. So I, I've, I've had that, that same experience as uh, you and your, your husband. Uh, when I was, you know, first doing this, you know, 20 plus years ago, you know, I had, I had back pain since I was 15. I remember thinking when I was 15, I've got like the back of a 60 year old man. It just, it always hurt. And I just figured because I just always played a lot of sports and was very active or you know, actually switched to wearing my, my wallet in my front pocket, because like, you know, you, you sort of sit on it funny and that can like cause a little back. And I was just trying to figure something yeah. out, yeah. That, you know, to, to help my back pain because it was just awful. And then all of a sudden I didn't have back pain at all for years. And I was playing, you know, very high level rugby. I was playing tons of games, training all the time. I had no back pain. And then, you know, I was 27 and I was down in, in San Diego and I had sort of slipped off the diet, um, you know, bit over the last sort of year, year or two. Um, and all of a sudden I was just like, oh, my, you know, my back kind of hurts. Like, hmm, that's funny. I haven't had back, my, my back pain, my back usually doesn't hurt. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. My back always hurts. And when the hell does this happen? I remember thinking back on my, like, wow, I really haven't had back pain in years. And then, wow, yeah. and then, you know, now if I, you know, eat just any, any amount of, you know, carbs or grains or, or, 
you know, rice or beans or anything like that, if they just sort of slip into my food at a restaurant or something like that, it, I, I will get serious uh, aches and pains, but I'll get like bad back pain, like stabbing pain in my lower back where it's just, it's yeah. uh, you know, to the point that I, I almost am non-functional. And, you know, I think that obviously I wasn't, you know, necessarily that, that bad with that small amount before, but you know, your body builds up resistances to different toxins. And so, you know, you'll just like a tolerance with alcohol, this is a poison and you're sort of going to build up a tolerance to it. You can right. build up these tolerances to these poisons as well and acclimatize yourself to them. And that's not a good thing. It just that means you know, your body's desperately trying to protect you from something harmful, but it does build up a bit. And so maybe it, it's not as, as, as profound as, as when you, it's completely out of your system and your body goes, oh, thank God we're not dealing with that crap anymore. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get yeah. it in there and you, and you get hit full in the face with it. And so I think, yeah. and also be, now you see the difference. Whereas like, I feel absolutely fantastic all the time now. And then like, all of a sudden you drop down, uh, you know, it just drops you a bit, you know, like, no, don't like that. I don't want that. And, and you can actually see that contrast quite clearly. Um, I was just going to say about like the back pain, because obviously, you know, in neurosurgery, we deal with back pain all the time. And unfortunately there are not many surgeries uh, that will, you know, there are not many causes of back pain that surgery is going to help. Unfortunately, 95% of back pain can be resolved by just strengthening the muscles that support the spine and that will hold it together more and that will reduce the pain 95 mm -hmm. there are some instances where where uh, surgery will help and maybe a fusion will help and so forth but these are things that that actually you know you don't want to have to do unless you have to do it and some people have to do it or else they're going to be in big trouble but you know if you can avoid if you can ever avoid the knife do it you know, and, and that's one of the things that I talk to people about and they're just in serious pain and, you know, or maybe we, you know, they have you know, serious, you know, uh, you know, pain from like a pinched nerve and we release the nerve and they still have the pain and we do an MRI and go, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's free and clear now, but that nerve's just been damaged because it's been compressed for a number of years and it's just not, it's just not waking up. And you know, and then we don't really have too many options for these people. Well, I try to tell them, I was like, like, listen, you know, there are different things in foods that will cause inflammation that will cause more pain. Uh -oh. And you know, me. you can try yeah. eliminating these things off and actually had fantastic results with a lot of people. Some people are quite resistant. I, I was actually talking to a lady today and, and she, she wanted that magic pill. She wanted that panacea. She wanted surgery to happen and all her problems to go away. And unfortunately, you know, <laughs> I say, unfortunately, fortunately, she actually had no, no structural problems with her back and she didn't have any, any sort of impinged nerves and, and, you know, structurally and neuro neurologically, she was completely intact, which is wonderful. That's, that's usually good news when you tell somebody that. And, and she was very upset because she had very bad back pain and she, she wanted there to be something wrong that we could fix. And I understand yeah. that completely, but you know, there wasn't, there wasn't anything. And, and so we just had to say, it was like, well, no, you need, you just need to strengthen these muscles and, yeah. and, you know, and, and you can try, you know, different sorts of foods and so forth, you know, eliminating things off, like, you know, especially like, you know, grains and beans and sugar and so forth. And, and she was just, I've never heard that. No one's ever told me that before. No one's ever said anything like that. I was like, okay, well, but it is something that you can try and, and, yeah. you know, and, and see how you go. And, Hopefully she does because, you know, I, I feel very sorry for her because she's, you know, she's not happy and she's in a lot of pain and, yeah. you know, they're, they're, we don't have a I, magic fix. We don't, we don't have, a I cure. know I, I completely understand that level of desperation. Something mm -hmm. I forgot to mention is also that I like struggled with acne mm -hmm. and I, I just, I did not understand what I could do about it. And I went from doctor to doctor and um, I would be, I didn't do the research just because I felt like when I saw the doctor, they're going to give me a solution. Right. And so it was mm -hmm. always in trying different solutions. So I did all the creams, um, three month antibiotic. <laughs> this is so stupid, but I did it. And then an another three month uh, birth control treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I did Accutane twice. Uh, spironolactone for two years, which messed oh. up my hormones for that yeah. while. And I, that's probably, yeah, it's, it's awful. So nothing worked, but it just gave me like a bandaid 
it, like mentally, oh, I'm I just wait until I finish this Accutane round, then, then I should have a solution or like, let's just wait until the second Accutane round ends. And I was constantly in that. So I completely understand and, and I empathize with her how when you're at your wits end and those are the only solutions that you think you have. And once those did not work out is when I really started doing the research and I came across Dr. Lauren Cordain, uh, you know, he's like the grandfather of the modern paleo movement. That was like my first introduction to alternative forms of dieting because all those diets were branded as a fad. I would go to school to become a dietitian and my homework would be like, why is this diet a fad? And why is that diet a fad? Every single diet on the planet was considered a fad, except what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics was recommending, which is, you know, all the carbs, the grains and the dairy and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. And that's just, that's just, that's not a fad. That's a farce. Yeah, right. like follow the money one of one of my favorite exercises i like to do with my students every semester is like like okay let's go to let's just at least check out the wikipedia page of the academy of nutrition and dietetics and like i'll scroll all the way down to the criticism and where where they talk about all of their partnerships you know yeah. with the food companies and the sugar foundation and it's like and everybody's like whoa what is, what yeah. is that you know yeah i mean yeah. serious conflicts of interest um yeah, absolutely crazy. So obviously you're, you're, you're teaching now, you're a professor at uh, Miami Dade, is that right? Miami Dade, yeah. 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 And so, so what, are you, what are you teaching your students? I mean, are you, you pitching the well, textbook or are you trying to, to show them what the hell is actually happening? Yeah, I can't, I can't bite my tongue. Um, technically, you know, I have, to, I have a textbook that, I, that we're following. So like, but the basics are basics, you know, like mm. carbs, you have you know, complex carbs and simple, like the basic biology is right. fine. There is no controversy there. But then when we get to the point where we're talking about the main energy source, it's, you know, they, their <laughs> textbook information states that it's glucose. And I'm like, okay, but also <laughs> there's this and that, you know, and the ketones are actually your natural fuel source. They're a cleaner source of fuel. It's a premium source of fuel for your cells and, and your brain cells. Um, they don't release as much waste products and don't damage your metabolism in the long term as much as burning sugar is your main energy source. So we talk about all those things. The good thing is that um, I've recorded all of my lectures. So it's like a flipped classroom. So they watch the recording. And then when we meet, it's just one-to-one -one, like discussions and Q&A. Um, first, because otherwise I would like kill myself if I kept on repeating the same lecture over and over again. <laughs> the second of all, they really do enjoy the interaction because that's when they really remember the importance of what we're talking about. So we end up mainly talking about um, what's going on in the field of nutrition right now, the wars between the vegans and the carnivores and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and they're very receptive. I mean, I've had amazing transformation stories with my students. Um, and I, and, and it's really fun. I, I just only have one devout vegan <laughs> this semester who's like on my case, you know, but it's also like, we, we take it as a joke because it's like every Tuesday in the afternoon, I take a deep breath. I'm like, here we go. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like every, every, anything I say, is like, well, what about this study? What about this meta-analysis, you know? Um, so, so we end up going back and forth with the studies and those kinds of things, but yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good yeah. though. You know, I, I, I liked, you know, doing that. I like talking to the vegans and vegetarians as well. Uh, just because, Hey, I like talking to people. I like sort of seeing how they, they tick, but, you know, also because, um, you know, they obviously are really passionate about this sort of thing. And I also, I want to know, you know, what I'm missing, you know? So I, you know, when, when I was early on in this, when I was really just finding out more and more and more and more and more and sat and asking questions, and, okay, okay. You know, if we're carnivores and if this is affecting our health, you know, in, in, in X, Y, Z fashion, you know, we should be seeing, you know, this in the literature, what are we seeing? And, you know, I, we'd be, I, I'd find things and be like, yeah, okay, that, that is what we're seeing. Okay. That's interesting. And, you know, keep going with that. But then, you know, when I, when I sort of satisfied a lot of my curiosity uh, in that regard, I sort of said, okay, I don't want to just be looking at things uh, that, that, you know, prove my point. You know, I want to try to, you know, prove myself wrong as I, you know, as any, 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 you know, honest, uh, 
you know, attempt right. at a study is supposed to be, yeah, you're supposed, you're, you're supposed to have a hypothesis and you're supposed to try to prove yourself wrong. Yeah. You know, you're not supposed to try to prove yourself right. You're supposed to try to yeah. prove yourself wrong. And so I was like, okay, great. All right. So I was, I was trying to find things that, that countered my, my thought on this. And so I was going to websites about, you know, you know, from vegan doctors and, and um, you know, and, and nutritionists and blogs and, and watching their videos and, and reading their, their uh, arguments and saying, and asking questions, okay, well, but what about this? Can you answer this? And then this, and they would, they would answer and so forth. And I just see what they, they had to offer. And it just became more and more apparent that was like, yeah, this is, this is really a house of cards. And, and it's not really, um, it's just not stacking up. You know, one of the main yeah. things that, uh, you know, vegans, that vegans I've spoken to a lot of, a lot of ones that have then sort of had that like, oh, okay, moment is, you know, you ask them how many supplements they take, you know, and it's just like, they, they're always taking a lot of them. If they're have, have any semblance of health, they're taking a lot of supplements because you, you don't last too long without taking supplements mm -hmm. as a vegan, um, not more than a few years anyway. And so they're always taking a lot of supplements and so, okay, well, why do you need to take supplements if you're eating what we're supposed to eat biologically? You know, what animal in the, in the wild take supplements, you know, oh, well, we give B12 shots to cows. No, we don't. We give B12 shots to cows in feedlots that are eating something they're not supposed to eat like us, you know, when they're eating grass, they don't, they don't get B12 shots. And so yeah. you know, no one's going to, and, and uh, that's sure. a big one. They're saying like, oh, well, we're giving, we're, we're giving the animals B12 shots anyway. You might as well just skip the middleman and give ourselves B12 shots. I'm like, really all animals, you know, so koalas are getting B12 shots. You know, squirrels are getting B12 shots. Pigeons are getting B12 right. shots. I mean, well, I mean, B12 is in the soil, you know, and you get it. They like, come on. Yeah. yeah. And so You're it's not just gonna like, get optimal levels. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just like, you know, it's like, I, I mean, I think it's wonderful that these teams of, of, of benevolent forest rangers are going around just giving all these injections for vitamins that these animals are just so deficient in. It's like, right. think for one second, you know, if, if you need to take supplements to get basic nutrition, then by definition, your diet is deficient. That, that is a, that is a definitional statement, Yeah. you know, and, and maybe you're, you know, you're eating meat and the meat for some reason is deficient because, you know, the soil is deficient in magnesium and zinc as it is in Australia. And so you're just gonna have a bit less magnesium and zinc or something like that, that can happen, you know, but you know, when we were talking about just dozens and dozens of nutrients that you are not getting on a vegan diet, you know, you have, you have to sort of, uh, yeah. sit up and take notice. And, uh, and that's, that's one thing I, I was in, a, in a discussion with a friend of mine who was finishing up her PhD in, um, you know, nutrition. And, and that was, that was really what got her. We were going just point for point study for study, probably like you were doing with your student. And that, that was the sticking point. She just said, it's like, okay, well, how many supplements do you take? And I sort of like took me back. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't take anything. Well, of course you do. Like everyone does like, what, well, what do you take? How much do you take? And I was like, no, 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 I don't, I don't take anything. I haven't ta have taken to. anything in years. Like, why would you have to take supplements if you're eating what your species evolved on? And, and all of a sudden she went crap, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then it started to sink in. And then she started really looking at things critically. And, and eventually she sort of just looked at me and just said, my entire education was a lie. So you convert. Wow. That's congratulations. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I've, I've got a hundred percent kill rate at this point really? for vegans and vegetarians. Yeah. hundred percent for, for everyone who's actually engaged in a conversation anyway, you know, okay, there, are, yeah. there are people that'll that's just go like, Oh no, you know, that's not true because you know, I st I stopped eating meat and then everything got better. And, and they just, they just don't want to uh, have a discussion. That's fine. They don't right. have to, yeah. but every, everyone that's, that's had, us, even if it was adversarial at first saying that like, Oh, how can you possibly do that or whatever? As long as, as long as they're receptive and will actually engage in the conversation, even if it's try to like, you know, prove me wrong and prove what a horrible person I am, I get them all. I've gotten every single one of them. Every single one of them has either turned carnivore directly or at least started eating a lot more meat. There's, there's one holdout where we went through and they always go through like, you know, nutritional. And then when they start losing the nutrition side of things, they go like, well, what about the, you know, the, the environment and they're saying, well, yes, you know, that's something that's very important. And I agree with you. It should be discussed. However, you know, we're just talking about nutrition right now. You know, what's the, what's the best thing for people to eat. And eventually they'll concede that point and say like, okay, I agree with you nutritionally. This is the best thing for us to do, but 
look at the environment. Great. Let's go into the environment. And, and we, we talked about that for a while. And I just did, did a video sort of discussing some of those points. And, and then they go, okay, well, what about the ethics side of things? Well, no, we're just talking about the environmental side of this thing right now. And then you, know, you go down and then you go down to the ethical side of things. So I, I did all that stepwise progression um, with this one person. And they just got to the end of it and they were like, yeah, I, you know what? I agree with you. I agree with everything you said. I, I agree that, you know, animal, you know, eating a carnivore diet is a high fat carnivore diet is, you know, the best thing that we can do nutritionally. I agree that it's the best thing for the environment. And I agree that, you know, it's ethically sound and probably more ethical than, 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 uh, the alternatives, but I just can't bring myself to eat an animal. I just, I just, you know, mentally that I just can't do that. And I'm like, that's, that's fine. You know, I mean, like it's, they're just like, they're just like, they just, it just made them feel really bad, uh, to do that. And so it's just like, okay, you know, that's, that's your choice, but it, at least you're making an informed decision. But that's know? strange that they would mm -hmm. agree with you on all major arguments, but yet still don't, I don't understand that part. I think that they they just really felt uh, you know strong affinity with animals and thinking more as pets and just the idea of of eating your pet would be abhorrent and I think that's that's where they were coming from it was just the idea of doing that just made them feel bad inside and so there was I I, just, I, can't, I can't do that and so you know maybe will, maybe yeah, eventually but, I mean animals will still die like people yeah. need to understand animals will still die in a far yeah. more gruesome manner on a plant-based diet you know mm. it's like the rabbits, the rabbits are much. cute exactly 25 yeah. times as much yeah. deer um fish from the runoff of the water and the pesticides mm. in the water um insects and 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 scorpions not scorpions <laughs> just thinking spiders just cute scorpions. little scorpions <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, like animals that are not necessarily all insects are yeah. they're sentient, they feel emotion, and they're dying in far more gruesome ways at a rate mm. of 25 times more mm. on a plant based diet. So, whichever way you look at it, it just makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, but you know, every, everyone else has just been like, okay, yeah, let's get a steak. Um, you know, she was just like, yeah, she just couldn't bring herself to do that. Maybe, maybe right. she came along eventually, but that was just sort of, you know, that discussion yeah. in a day. And so but saying, congratulations. It's really good that you're, that you have the patience, you know, to go through, cause it takes a lot of time to go through all yeah. the arguments to finally being able to convert somebody. Yeah, you know, it, it does, but I think it, you know, I think it's an interesting, you know, way to engage. And, and I always like to hearing, uh, you know, other people's arguments. And I like to see, okay, you know, what am I missing? Is there, is there something else that, that I'm not, um, that I'm, you know, not picking up on and maybe I haven't seen yet. Um, right. you know, that's why I was, I was really interested in doing that. The, um, the debate, the carnivore versus vegan debate with the Australian college of, uh, yeah. nutrition, environmental medicine, which was, which was fun. We had three people on the carnivore side, or at least meat based side and three people on the vegan side. And I remember yeah. sort of getting into this, you know, and there were, you know, there were, you know, people that were, you know, very, very intelligent, very, you know, uh, uh, you know, acclaimed in their field. Uh, you know, one was a, was a cardiologist in Sydney. One, um, I, th I think she was a pediatrician in Sydney as well. And, you know, she had a, you know, master's of public health from Harvard. And this is where she started getting into the whole plant-based thing as well, which was over at Harvard when they're just pushing this whole plant-based ideology. And, um, you know, that was, that was actually one of the things that my parents, you know, my whole, uh, most of my family went to, you know, colleges such as, you know, Pomona and Harvard and, and, um, you know, Yale and Columbia and so forth. And we were told when I was growing up that we were absolutely forbidden to go to any Ivy league school. And I was just like, why? And it was like, well, because they're, they're indoctrination camps they are just political indoctrination camps. And, you know, you're not, you're going to get a better education at say the University of Washington, which is a fantastic school, uh, than you will, you know, at one of these schools and you're not going to get just, just this, you know, ideology just shoved down your, your throat. And, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I, that would have really gotten me, but, uh, and the University of Washington is, is, uh, you know, pretty bad as well, but, um, but either way, that was, all, that was, that was sort of it. Yeah. 
and it's so, just the way that the system is set up, you know, because yeah. you have to get along with the rest of your department and you have mm. to come like together to agree on a program. You can't you, you, like what happened to Professor Bart K. Right? He's talking about carnivore diets when everybody else is teaching the office and the students are confused. And then it becomes a problem for the other professors who are being asked, well, but Professor Bart K. told me this, like, I yeah. understand why that happens. It's just kind of like the bureaucracy. Um, negative side of it yeah. right well you get that group think unfortunately yeah. and yeah and you, and you get into trouble that way and 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 there's a lot of problems there there was um there's a book i read called uh, the big bang never happened and it, and it goes through with all a lot of very very famous uh, astrophysicists and so forth nobel prize winners etc et talking about you know basically plat it's the difference between plasma physics and um and gravitational uh physics and so you know the gravitational people are saying big bang big bang black holes dark matter all that sort of stuff and the plasma guys yeah. are saying like you're way off all those things are fudge factors and actually has this whole book that just lays out the math and there was a there's a documentary by the same name that's available on youtube i don't know if, where else it's available but it's certainly on youtube and it um it it sort of goes through sort of the the back room sort of political issues that some of these very famous uh uh physicists and and astrologists went through and then one guy was talking about how he was the director of this uh research institution and and university and and there was a, a grad student who was doing a phd and all she was doing was finding interesting things she was like oh wow look at this and look at this and look at this and this was basically showing evidence that went counter to the sort of that that narrative and one of the professors came into a board meeting it was just like you know we've got to cut her uh grant we've got to cut her um uh tuition we have to we have to just get her out of the program just kick her out of here because you know she's finding things it's not like she was doing anything she wasn't doing this on purpose she was just finding this stuff she was just challenging. discovering things yeah. well she, she wasn't even challenging it she was just saying look i found this isn't that crazy you know it was just like you know, it's, it's like, wow. you know, finding someone's dog, you're like, well, shoot him, you know, and it's just like, well, I, just, you know, I didn't do anything. And so, you know, they talked about and this guy was very charismatic, and he had a lot of sway with the with the other board members and he was saying, you know, we need to we need to cut this, this woman's uh, entire um, program, we need to like, kick her out of a PhD program, because she's, you know, doing research and she's finding things that that can be, you know, embarrassing to, you know, other people's research and, you know, goes counter to, you know, everything that, you know, we we're, we're doing. And he convinced yeah. everyone there and they all voted and, you know, they all voted to, to kick her off the program. And this guy said that, you know, it's like, so they all voted and that's fine, but I was the director and it wasn't a democracy and I had final say, so she stayed, you know? And so it's like, thank God that this guy was in a position to do that. Um, but there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of that out there. And, um, yeah. You know, yeah, that's like Planck's principle, right? Science advances one funeral at a time. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> they even did, like, there was a paper, I did a, a YouTube video um, highlighting that paper that came out in 2019. Um, basically, they, they, they run the numbers, and it turns out, yeah, it's true. Once a famed researcher dies, their close collaborators, number of papers dips in the years following. And then the mm. other newbies into the field, they start putting out more and more. They start publishing a lot more on that same field, but like in a different way. You know, they're driving okay. progress, basically. It, they're they're yeah. going in a different direction when they didn't really want to challenge the status quo before or they couldn't get through before. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, that, that's... Um... Yeah, un that's very unfortunate that that happens. But you, you know, these guys they stake their entire reputation, their entire careers on this, and they don't yeah. have you know the testicular fortitude to say, you know what, I got it wrong, <laughs> and um, and let's let's go in a different direction. The only the only time yeah. I've really heard about you know um, Richard Dawkins from uh, Oxford talks about this because he writes about religion and versus science. He says science is so great because you know you can be proven yeah. wrong and you know someone will come up and shake your hands like oh you've disproven my entire life's work. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And yeah. um yeah and he describes this as happening in Oxford once. And but he only tells that story because I'm pretty sure he's never seen it again. Um that is the isolated incidents, you know, but it can happen. It's supposed to happen. 
Um, but unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't always. My father, when he was doing his, his PhD at Berkeley uh, in, in uh, math and physics, he was a um, physicist at the Lawrence Livermore Radiation Laboratory there in Berkeley. And one of his professors, um, you know, they were, they were, he was on Louis Alvarez's team who, you know, got the Nobel Prize for, you know, cracking the atom and studying subatomic particles and developing the bubble wow. chamber and so forth. And so my father was on his team when they were, they were doing that work. And so they're discover, discovering all these, you know, these plasma forces and these attractive, uh, you know, ionic forces between like, you know, negatively, negatively charged um, electron and a positively charged proton and, and how this was 10 to the 42nd power times more powerful than gravity, than the gravitational force between those two objects. And so he walked into uh, his professor's office and the guy was just, you know, shell shocked. And he just said, you know, he was just all out, out of it. And my, my dad said like, mm, you know, is everything okay? Like did something happened. And he just said, I think I've wasted the last 20 years of my life. And my dad was like, really? Like, you know, what happened? He's like, it's 42 orders of magnitude more times more powerful than gravity. Gravity can't be the answer. It cannot be. You know, these plasma forces have to be, it, it just simply cannot be the driving force in the universe. Obviously it's a major factor, plays wow. a major role, but it's not the main role. And so he said, I've, I've wasted the last 20 years of my life. And so he actually scrapped all the things that he was doing. He completely shifted gears and went to an entire different vein of research because of that. The, you know, that is probably the only time I've actually ever heard of someone doing that because it, it, it takes a lot, you know, you're, you are really giving up your entire career and trying to remake your name. And, yeah. and people are afraid they go with like, Oh, what if I just say, Oh, everything I did was a lie. How can they believe anything else I say? I was like, well, right. because you're honest, <laughs> you know, like exactly. you That's sacrificed exactly right. so much and just said, look, look, we found something new. We've got to move on, which is what Einstein did all the time. By the way, people don't know that. People think that you can just prove something mathematically and go, well, I have this mathematical proof. This is what it is because Einstein said we could have this theory of everything and so forth. But when Einstein had a theory and he had, you know, made equations and proved something mathematically, and then they found, in, you know, ob through observation and so forth, something to test it against, and it didn't show up to be right, he scrapped it. He was like, well, that was wrong. Obviously, I didn't know everything that was going on there. There's something else happening. And, yeah. and that's, that's something that any you know, honest, ethical, real scientists needs to be able to do, you know? That's amazing. I had no idea about your background. Um, and that must be fun growing up, having a physicist mm. for a father, right? It and, was, you yeah. know, engaging in those kinds of conversations. Yeah, That's it was. Really yeah. Yeah. Dinner table conversations were always very interesting. You know, my mom's a very, very intelligent, very educated uh, woman as well. And so they, they, they always joked around if they would ever went on couples jeopardy, they, they would never get a question wrong. Like one of them will know every single time. And uh, it would have been funny to actually see if they had, if they had done that, but you know, and then we had, you know, I had four siblings. So there were five of us and we were always interested in different things and studying different things. So yeah, it was always very interesting conversations at the table. You actually learned quite a lot just over the dinner table through that. I can imagine. Yeah. No, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I was going to say like about that, um, to circle back to the beginning of that, um, you know, that lady that was at, that, at Harvard, it was in that debate, you know, she sort of got, uh, you know, into the whole vegan plant-based mindset while at Harvard. And, and that's what she says. So, oh, I was learning this and this was at Harvard. So obviously Harvard's correct. And that is the mindset that Harvard teaches you. My, my grandparents met at Harvard and that was what they said. They're like, this is like, they teach you that if you went to Harvard, it's right, no matter what, you know? And then my, my, my grandmother also went to Chicago, which was the exact opposite. Say, you need to test this. You need to prove it. You have two theories. You need to find evidence in which to test them against. Um, and uh, whereas people who go to Harvard, it's just like, I went to Harvard. Excuse me. That's right. Because I went to Harvard and I've right. met people like this. And my grandfather told me that when he was there, like that was, that was how they tried to instill that. And it was, it was pretty toxic. And um yeah. But, so she went to That's Harvard like, and therefore it's yeah. right, you know? And so, yeah. you know, and then she came into this debate and with the, the other two who were, you know, were great. They were, they were, you know, very intelligent, very, very uh, learned people, but they didn't bring a single argument that I hadn't heard a hundred times before. And, and I was actually, actually quite you know nervous. I was just like, okay, you know, 
What if I see something I haven't seen before? How am I going to react to this or that? And so I was, I was doing a lot of prep work and it was just like, not a single thing was new, not a single thing. It was just the same tired ass lies that have just been disproven time and time again. It was, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go to these kinds of universities or even most universities are espousing a plant-based diet and mm. you're going to believe it because I believed it until I realized that um, I, I want to look better. I want to feel better. I, I, I want to constantly push my limits. And so in my drive to do that, I realized that everything that I was taught was, was wrong. So you have to either be put in a situation where you must change because you have some form of autoimmune condition or something, or if you yeah. don't have that, then you have to have an inner drive to push the limits and challenge yourself because nobody's perfect and you can always do better always in every single area of your life. And so those are the only two situations where I feel like people who, who went to a traditional um, school or university can actually start challenging those beliefs and ideologies because they went through that experience and um and it's rare it's 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 rare to find i don't know what what are your thoughts what other i don't know what other hope we have because right now most universities are doing this yeah and i think i think that is a problem because everyone's getting the traditional dogma and really what it is propaganda um pumped into their heads and and you know some people that it, you know it's funny you know some people you know if they you know they're you know thomas Sowell, who's like my favorite you know writer author thinker uh, and so forth also went to harvard also had a lot of disparaging remarks about harvard um you know he said that it, you know it takes a lot of knowledge to understand just how ignorant we are and and it really does you know it, you have to know so much you have to know a lot to realize, yeah. to, to really crest that hill and look over and realize, oh my God, I, there is just <laughs> so much I just don't know and don't understand. Yeah. And to have a little humility about it, you know, the, it was like a, it's, it's, it's sort of famously quoted, but it's a, it's a poem, I think from the 1500s called the Epirian Spring. And it is, that's the fountain of knowledge. And it said, you know, uh, drink deep or taste not the Epirian Spring or the, yeah, the Epirian Spring because a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And then it goes on, you know, to describe how this is a bad idea, but that's what I say, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And it really is, you know, you get, you just get a little taste of it and you just think, yeah, I know everything from here. And, and this is a trap I call it, you know, the, the, the trap of the, of the intelligent, and the educated is because they are, you know, people can be educated and intelligent and do so well at whatever their, you know, specific uh, field of expertise is. And then they fall into the trap because they think, you know, I can just, I I'm, I'm good at figuring things out. And so they see something, I can figure this out. And, and then they just make assumptions and, you know, maybe in the past they've been able to make good assumptions and they've been close enough that they've had this, uh, you know, that the, they've grown this false confidence and now they're just making these, they're just making these assumptions and assumptions. And it's just like, you're, you're yeah. going to set yourself up for defeat. Actually, um, you know, Thomas Sowell has written about this for decades now about, you know, intellectuals and so forth that you know they're they're very expert in their field but then they go outside of their field and and they get things horribly wrong but because they're such a yeah. you know an authority in in their respected field you know people go like oh wow you know this guy this guy's really good and they know and they know how to talk about it and they know how to speak authoritatively as well but it's, it's just not their field and so yeah. they they get things very very yeah. wrong and you know if someone were to go into their field and talk out yeah. of their ass you know, that's they like just, Hollywood they just, in a nutshell, well, right? Like, yeah, that's it. right? Like the actors, like amazing actors with, mm. you know, all this experience and they just like greats, the greats of Hollywood, but then mm. they're also vegan. And it's like, you have mastered this field, but with nutrition and the scientific yeah. world, it's like, you're so off, you know? Yeah. Think, well, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing, you know, they forget how much time and effort they put in to being exactly. great at their field. And, you know, all these, all these, you know, great intellectuals and so forth, who have really, really worked hard, spent decades mastering, you know, linguistics, math, arts, whatever it is. And then they go into, you know, sociopolitical, you know, endeavors, and it's just like, oh, but no, you haven't been doing that for 30 years. 
you know, exactly. and, and if someone came into your field and started spouting off, he goes, oh, well, actually I've read this one book one time and, you know, I know everything about it. Yeah. Like you'd crush them, you know, exactly. and then you can step into someone else's field and be like, I know everything yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it, you need to be able to have uh, yeah. that, that introspection and go like, okay, yeah, this, this isn't, this yeah. isn't, this isn't my field, you know? I understand that. I mean, it happens to every one of us, like, cause I'm, I'm focused on what I'm interested in, right. Doing the research on what I'm interested in, but then things are happening in the world and I'm supposed to have an opinion on that. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been in that field long enough yeah. because I keep what happened to me in nutrition always in mind. I mean, I had, by the time I had my PhD, I was still to a degree brainwashed. I was still doing keto, but Mm. not really fully carnivore you know and imagine a decade more than a decade in academic world in in nutrition and health and I was still so off so you know it's difficult and I understand why people are so frustrated and confused because they're busy they have jobs and families and they don't have all the time in the world to put into figuring out every single best solution in every single area of their life so it, it's a problem. I get it, but there's no lazy way around it. If you have an issue, you're struggling with it. You have to put in the work. You can't just listen to one expert and believe everything that they say. There's just no, no two ways about it. You have to put in the work in anything that you really want to become better at. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that was, uh, you know, another quote, it's, it's a quoting day for me, but, you know, John Stuart Mill, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah. I love quotes, by the way. Like you see, my there's like quote after quote. I get like haters sometimes. It's like, okay, Gandhi. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love quotes. I think the power of words is so powerful. You know? Absolutely, you know, and and there have been some you know amazing thinkers and and you know, people out there. I mean, there's a reason we're still reading Socrates and Plato, you know, and Homer, because these things yeah. were were fantastically done, and and there's a lot we can learn from them. Um, yeah. John Stuart Mill on Liberty, I believe he, you know, he said, you know, to paraphrase, you know, he said that, um, you know, if you only know your side of the argument, then you don't know much. If you haven't heard the other side of the argument, the opposing argument from, you know, in its most convincing form, you know, from a professor who's espousing this belief, you know, if you're just hearing it from your own professors and people that, that you want to listen to you know, your, your favorite YouTube uh, personalities and so forth. You know, if you're only hearing that, then you don't necessarily even know the opposing argument. If you haven't heard it in its most convincing form from its most convincing advocate, then you, you don't even know what, what the argument is. And, you know, I try to not straw man people, but that, that's what it's called. You know, people say, well, this is their argument and this is why it's wrong. Okay, maybe, but is that actually their argument? You know, you're obviously not trying to convince people of this argument. And yeah. so you're not going to give it in its most convincing form. And so, you know, sure. I encourage people to go out and, and see and see for themselves, you know, go look at Gundry's stuff, go look at, you know, Michael Greger's stuff, if you can, <laughs> like if you can handle it, I and, know. you know, and um, he, he's, you know, he's <laughs> a bit pretentious, but, you know, you he's know, aging a little bit quickly, don't you think? I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody agrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, it's not like, you know, I, it's not like I, I, you know, I get any enjoyment from saying that I think that the you yeah. know, the guy is doing his best and he's doing something that he believes in, but I just think he's, he's gotten it wrong. And I think he's one of those guys that's in too deep at this point. And, yeah. you know, even if he realizes this is the wrong way to go, he may not, he may not take the out because his entire reputation and career is completely staked on this. Um, but people yeah. should go and see what he has to say. People should go and see uh, what these proponents of a vegan diet have to say. I mean, I did. I wanted to know, you know, if I was missing anything. I wasn't, but you know, it was. It was. It's nice to know that, and yeah. and then see you know, and, and see from them. You know, I did. I did a a series of of videos called Things Vegans Say, and it's just and I just played a recording of what you know these people are saying from their mouth. I'm not saying what they're saying. This is what they're saying. And I'm going through why I disagree with that and, and the evidence against it. Um, but I think that's very important. I think it's very important for people to look at both sides of the argument. And, you know, as you know, people learn when they go to colleges like University of Chicago, if you have two competing theories, you should be able to find some piece of evidence with which to test them against. 
Yeah. I think there's a lot out there. A very simple one is, do you have to take supplements? You yeah. know, if you don't again, on carnivore, yeah, you do on vegan. That's, it's pretty simple for me. That's, on that one. That, that's you can convince people who are, um, who are, who's a vegan because they think that that's the first step towards health. But then you have like a cultish kind of behavior in certain vegans, a lot of them, where it's more about the environment and the ethical treatment or humane, you know, treatment of animals. Yeah. And I see a lot of people, you know, commenting, it's like, I don't care if I'm deficient because I had a video that said 13 nutrient deficiencies on a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that blew the fuse of a lot of vegans. <laughs> they did not like that one. I mean, it was posted everywhere, like multiple yeah. debunking videos where there was no debunking involved. Yeah. And so you'll see comments there of, of vegans who are like, I don't care what the, what the Disney PhD is saying. The pretty Disney the PhD Disney. is what they call That's it. Nice. Why Disney? I don't understand that. But Florida, anyway. I'm guessing, but yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Disney world. Yeah. I, that's if it, if it's something else, then it doesn't even make any sense, but I think that maybe that's the connection. Right. Right. That makes sense though. You know, I don't care what she says as, you know, I, I will always be a vegan, you know, because of the animals or whatever, or, you know, and enjoy eating dead animals, something to that effect. It's always, it's not about their health, you know? Yeah. And I think veganism as a movement never really started to improve anyone's health. It was more mm -hmm. about let's not kill the animals. And then people were like, well, but my, I'm deteriorating. My health is going down. It's like, yeah. oh no, don't worry. It's actually healthy for you as yeah. well. That kind of got lumped in later on, you know? Yeah. And yeah, especially with the advent of, you know, vilifying fat and, and cholesterol They're saying, oh, this stuff causes heart disease. Yeah. It makes you fat. Fat makes you fat. You are what you eat. You eat fat, you get fat. Okay. Have I, have I, has anyone turned into a broccoli? You know, so, you know, that, that's right. pretty, pretty dumb, but you know, yeah, that, that's sort of when it came in that, like, oh, there's no fat in it. And it, it helps you lose weight because there's fiber and it doesn't actually, that was the argument. It didn't have nutrients. It didn't have much nutrition. <laughs> and so you should eat this because you're yeah. actually going to be losing weight every, with every stick of celery that you eat. Um, you know, but it, you know, it did, you know, there were, there were, you know, the history of, of, you know, eating plants was always people that couldn't afford it or they weren't allowed it because it, it kept, you know, it, it was proper nutrition. It kept people strong, made them grow big and they could, you know, buck the system, you know, and, and people didn't want that. And then in, you know, the early 1800s, they had different doctors and Puritans in America trying to push a vegan diet because it suppressed the hormones. It suppressed the people's natural libido and, you know, the fornication and masturbation was just, was just the worst thing on earth. Seems like it was pretty good back then. If that's the biggest concern that these people had, you know, right. and, right. and, um, you know, so, you know, so the, you know, seventh day Adventists came up and just said, yeah, you shouldn't eat meat because, you know, it makes you, you virile and healthy. It's like, that was, that was the argument was to make you less healthy. Not that they necessarily thought yeah. about it in those terms, but that is what it is. And, you know, this is where Kellogg cereal comes from. You know, Ke you know, Dr. Kellogg was a doctor and he, he pushed uh, for a vegan uh, diet because he wanted to suppress uh, people, uh, you know, having sex and, and masturbating. Yeah. He's also, yeah, he, thought, he, thought, he thought that masturbation was a sin. And yeah. so he was like, here, have some cornflakes. That'll fix yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and, and more than that, he's the guy, yeah. cause he was also a congressman. He's the guy who put, who pushed through recommendations, government uh, official recommendations that young boys should be circumcised in America. And this was had nothing to do with med um, any medical reasons, but that's what it was pitched as. This is this is this is good for boys. You know, you, you don't have to you know clean it as well and so forth. There's lower cancer rates and blah blah blah. There are low, higher cancer rates if you don't wash yourself. Basic hygiene you have, is no difference. Um, so he he's the one who pushed that through, and this is why you know people in America started started uh, uh, circumcising their kids because it's you know it's it's harder. To, to masturbate and have sex if you're if you're circumcised you know and then people figured out lube and that was, you know that was the end of the game but then they didn't actually say you know oh, okay well you know you might as well just not you know you know uh, circumcise this kid anymore because that, that was the only reason we did it and so this is still going on today people are still wow. doing this to their children and they they don't need to it doesn't actually confer a benefit health-wise you know but that's yeah. where that's where it came from from yeah. that maniac yeah. 
and, and veganism as well, you know? So it's like, yeah, like you say, it, it wasn't, it wasn't to better health. That was, that was a new introduction to the whole vegan movement. Um, and, uh, you yeah. know, it, you know, Hitler was a vegetarian for animal rights too. Not many people know that he loved animals. Didn't and Yeah. He loved the animals. Yeah. 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 No. And he was a vegetarian because of that. I don't know if he's, I don't think he's full vegan, but he was vegetarian. You know, one of, one of the classic examples See, of an angry vegan. Exactly. You know, and uh, well, I mean, it could be that and the tertiary syphilis, but like, you know, the guy was not right in the head. And so, you know, and I don't, you know, and, uh, you know, the spinach. See, I wasn't knew you were going to anyway. learn something from this interview. I learned a lot of things. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I want to dig into that, all this stuff, especially the Hitler and the circumcision. I think people need to know about these things. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, we, yeah, the history on these things is, is not what you think. I mean, this is why it's important to study history, to understand that most things that we take for granted are based in, in very suspect uh, origins. And some of them just outright bullshit. You know, yeah. like the circumcision, like the you know the Seventh Day Adventists and veganism and and cholesterol. You know that was that was a complete con, and you know we have hard yeah. evidence of these sort of things. This is this is a matter of yeah. record. You know this isn't a guess. This isn't an argument. You don't need a study to show it. That's that's it's historical fact. And so yeah, it's it's very important to 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 know these sorts of things and to know the history. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was going to say, I, I know you have a, a class to teach, but if you had time, could you tell us a bit about anti-aging and, and how, how we're going to live forever? Oh, yes. So um, I would urge everybody to look up Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Um, he is now embroiled in some sexual harassment thing where he stepped down from the company he founded, which is Sense Foundation, S-E-N-S -S Foundation. This, uh, this foundation's main work and Dr. Abri de Grey's work is um, reversing and curing the, and, uh, the aging process because the aging process is really a disease state. So as you age, as, as you age, you're basically losing your health. And most people don't think of it that way. Most people's views regarding the aging process and death is that it's an inevitability. But if you look into the research and there's a lot of research on uh, aging and anti-aging, you will notice that we have been able to reverse the aging process a lot, at least in animal models. And in humans, we've been able to reverse hallmarks or parameters of aging to a certain extent. And so clearly, if we can reverse the aging process, that means we can cure it. And that means a lot of the conditions that come along with it, like heart disease and cancer, this is why we see them at a much higher frequency at an older age. Those things, we don't have to worry about targeting them individually if we just look at the root cause, which is the aging process. And so why I do a carnivore diet and why I, I exercise and I work out and I do all the things that I do is because mainly I don't want to die ever and I don't want to get old. I want to just be as fit and healthy and do what I'm doing and just be happy for as long as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And so this is why within my YouTube channel, I did not set out to be on like a carnivore only. I'm doing everything that I that I am passionate about, of which anti-aging is a big thing. So if you scroll down to my uh, the last playlist on the homepage of my YouTube channel, you'll find a playlist all about anti-aging. And so I'm constantly putting out content on that. And I want people, and I hope people start to recognize that we have so much control over the aging process. Like if you just look at vitamin D, if your vitamin D levels are in the optimal range in the upper quartile, you can add five years to your life just by checking your telomeres, which is a, it's like a test that you can do, which is actually really cheap telomere length. It can add the equivalent of five years to your life. And that's just one nutrient that we're optimizing for. So there's so much we can do. And as more and more people start understanding that we can control it and we start looking at the aging process as a disease state, then our government and the NIH can actually allocate money and funds to actually research it seriously and stop wasting time. And then we can develop even quicker uh, and better you know, treatments. And according to Aubrey de Grey, who I actually started talking about, um, he says that in the next 
15 years, 15, that's one five, there is a 50-50 chance that we can achieve something called escape velocity. Escape velocity is that point in time where if you choose to live forever, you can because you would be doing all the things that medicine has to offer you to extend your life just enough time so that medicine catches up and, and gives us even newer treatments and modalities. And so basically just hang in there. There's a 50, 50 chance in the next 15 years, you can choose to live forever. And I know what I'm going to do. So <laughs> hopefully more people can, you know, put some more pressure so that we can do this thing. Ah, that'd be cool. So, yeah. so you said vitamin D and getting levels up to, up to what yeah, you need to do. Upper quartile, I think it's like 80 nanograms. Um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick um, actually has a video on that where she talks about it. I'll send you the link of the video and maybe oh, I yeah. can dig up the, the, the article after this, uh, after I finish teaching. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. are there anything else that people can just do besides a carnivore diet and taking vitamin D or the things that do at home and or there's, there's all sort of prescribed treatments? There's a ton of things, bioidentical hormone replacement, NAD plus, um, injections, um, optimizing for nutrient status. Um, exercise is a big one too, because it kills off your zombie cells. That's another interesting topic. They're called senescent cells, which um, are cells that are not fully dead, but they just hang in there. Instead of dying completely, they just hang in there, but they're not fully functional. But the problem is that they're continuously pumping out inflammatory molecules into your system. And so it's that inflammation that drives the aging process. And so exercise has been shown to kill off those senescent cells, you know, so there, there is so much, so much we can do. And again, check out my channel because I have tons yeah. of content on that. And I know that no matter what, I will always constantly be talking about that and putting content on that, whatever I find. So awesome. Well, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, can you tell us uh, where we find you and, and how we get a hold of your stuff? Thank you, Anthony. Um, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Dr. Dr. Dot Sarah with an H dot Zaldivar. I'm sure I'm going to send you all this stuff. So mm -hmm. there'll be a link below. Um, also, my YouTube channel, Dr. Sarah with an H Zaldivar, Facebook. Um, TikTok, I'm not really doing it much right now, but I will. I mean, I do have it, but it's old, but I'm going to update it soon. Yeah, Twitter. I'm sort of the same way. I'm, I'm sort of fighting against that. I'm certainly not going to yeah. do any stupid ass dances, but, you know, I, you know put, put some little things <laughs> yeah. on there just to, you know, yeah. some videos out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, all the places, but mainly it's YouTube and Instagram right now if you really want to be up to date with what I'm doing. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, yeah. I'll put all, all that in the show notes. And, um, and then, and, uh, any sort of the, some of the studies and things like that you want to send away, uh, away too. I'll put those in the show notes as well awesome. for people to see. All right, great. Dr. Zaldivar, thank you so much for joining me. It was a lovely talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Chafee. And I yeah. will see you soon. Thank you everyone. You. <laughs> right. Bye.